I'm Scott Allen Miller, this is Sam IT, and today we're going to discuss a bespoke software for your small business. So first of all, what is bespoke software? So bespoke software refers to software that we're creating in-house for ourselves, custom software. Most places when they're buying software or getting software for their business, they're dealing with off-the-shelf software. You just go to the store, go online, buy whatever you need, right? Windows, uh, Microsoft Office, just whatever it is. It's something that somebody already created and you're just purchasing it or getting it for free. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But for a lot of businesses, this software may not exactly meet your needs, uh, whether it doesn't come with the support that you need, or it's very costly, or it just doesn't fit your business model, whatever. There's a lot of reasons why businesses may not want to use simple off-the-shelf software, even very expensive, very complex off-the-shelf software. It simply may not meet your needs, or in order to meet your needs, it may be extremely costly and difficult to um, uh, to customize to meet your needs. This is this is the case with a lot of ERP software. You'll find companies that may purchase ERP software for a couple hundred thousand dollars and then find themselves several hundred thousands of dollars of customization away from it being actually usable for them, sometimes to very great surprise. With bespoke software, we have an opportunity to look at our software that we're using in our business, at least some of it, certainly not every piece of software that you're working with in your business, uh, and look at it from a uh, understanding that business is not something that is generic and that our software is potentially a core part of our business workflow and we could potentially make something that is custom for our business allowing us to leverage competitive advantage dramatically in some cases by allowing us to simply work better than other companies or work differently than other companies bespoke software presents a pretty big opportunity. So companies are very interested in bespoke software when they understand what it is. But the question is not really, why would we want bespoke software? That's pretty simple. Our company is somewhat unique compared to other companies, or at least our industry is somewhat unique. And therefore, we may want software that leverages that. It's that simple. Now, if you have a cookie cutter business that is exactly the same as millions of other businesses, which is not really that common unless you're a franchise, um, then there probably isn't off-the-shelf software that's really good for you. There may be stuff that's good enough for you, but there's very rarely something that is correct, perfect for you, right? You will have some piece of your business that is simply different, and that's what makes you a good business, right? If you were the same as everybody else, and the only thing you had going for you was location, perhaps, then it's really easy for someone to step in and compete by simply opening a shop across the street all they have to be is one penny cheaper, and then how are you going to compete? You can get into a cost war. But if you're providing a unique service in some way, or if you're providing a unique product, you have a competitive advantage, and you're different. You can't just copy what someone else is doing. So, bespoke software makes sense from a if it was magic. Now the question is, can you do it? And the reality is, is that most companies either think bespoke software is going to be so cheap and easy that they wonder why it doesn't just cost $10,000. I can buy software for $10,000, why can't I make it myself? That's ridiculous. Um, and then on the other hand, you have places that say, well, there's no way I could ever make bespoke software. It's, uh, it's completely out of reach, therefore I'm never going to consider it. And in reality, bespoke software 99% of the time falls somewhere solidly between the two. It is an expensive endeavor or everyone would do it because it's that valuable. You would just always start a business with, well, what's our bespoke software plan for this new business? But it is very costly. So companies do want to look at off-the-shelf software and see if it meets their needs. If you're in a business where off-the-shelf software meets your needs very well, you probably want to use that. But if you're not, you want to really seriously consider how bespoke software may enable your business and look at realistically how much it's going to cost. Now, there's two sides of this. There's the engineering side, which we'll talk about in a moment, and there's the IT side. From the IT perspective, we're not the ones who make bespoke software, just like we're not the ones who build a car if we're in, a, in an auto company, right? But we are the ones who are going to need to deploy and operate it. So we have concerns that need to be addressed, such as will the software work with our infrastructure? If it's our infrastructure planning around this software, how would it impact all the things that we do? Chances are bespoke software will not make that worse. It'll probably make that better, especially if the development team is working with the IT team to make sure that there's a cohesive uh, vision to how everything's going to happen. Bespoke software, one of the most important values that tends to come from it is that you're able to demand that you're going to make modern 
good software. So much of what's out there for business is go ship, see my video on go ship software, or just total garbage or overpriced or whatever, but it tends to not be very good because there's not a lot of competition in the field. And let's be honest, small businesses are very bad about voting with their wallet. They tend to be like, eh, software, not my problem, good enough and buy whatever's out. And so by purchasing good enough or not even good enough software and just ignoring it as someone else's problem, then they're really strongly voting with their wallet and telling vendors, I don't want good software enough to pay for it, so I'm gonna buy whatever you offer. And of course, those companies are gonna do the thing that makes them the most money, which is continue to offer whatever thing they already have and make nothing else, because there's no reason to make anything else because their customers are coming to them anyway. So small businesses are very, very bad about making a competitive environment for good software to be out there. So they tend to be stuck with awful stuff. We can fix that with bespoke software. We can make software that is lean, that is fast, that is easy to deploy, that is resilient, that can be backed up. We'll know how to back it up. All kinds of information that sometimes is very hard to get from your software vendors for an IT team, such as how do I reliably take a backup? How do I reliably restore? How do I deploy this using modern Dev app, DevOps tools? All those things, when you are doing bespoke software, you can make sure you know how to do and do flawlessly. And so you can, from an IT perspective, dramatically reduce your cost, increase your performance, sleep better at night, maybe even have great failover, right? So from an IT perspective, bespoke software is like a godsend. Now, from the engineering side, this is not IT, but quite often IT is going to need to become involved because somebody has to know how to do this. And if you're a company that isn't already making software, then who are you going to talk to? There's nobody in the organization that will know anything. IT is going to be the closest one. So as IT professionals, we are likely to get dragged into this conversation. And that's fine. We're a great team to be involved. We should have a voice at the table. But the first thing our voice should say is we need to bring in development resources because bespoke software is not something any other team could possibly consider doing. There's no possibility, right? Rule it out right now. Don't go down that path and try to say, well, maybe. Imagine if you did the same thing with IT, right? Well, the recession receptionist kind of knows computers, we'll just let him do it. Of course, it's going to be a disaster and you're going to lose everything and you're going to get ransomware. The company's going to fall apart. We know that from an IT perspective. We need to make sure that other departments are treated with the same respect. You would never expect HR or finance to be just given over to someone who doesn't understand HR or finance. You wouldn't expect operations or development to be done in the same way. So development needs skilled professional developers. Now, just some real quick things about developers. Realistically, you always need a team of at least two people. In theory, you could have one person who knows how to wear two completely different hats. That would generally be far more expensive and less productive than two people who wear hats and can focus on what they're good at. One is the actual developer. This is the person who writes the code. The other is an analyst, systems analyst, sometimes called a SAD. Some people refer to this role as business analyst, but they're, that term tends to mean you're not doing all the pieces, just some, it's like a subset. Um, and so that wouldn't be enough for you. Uh, if you're in a larger development team, you may have a SAD with business analysts under them. There's lots of different ways you may mix it up once you're beyond two people. But if you just have two people, you need someone who is designing the software. And so you may think of them as an architect, you may think of them, but it's systems analysis and design is the role that they're filling. And then the other one is actually writing the code. And you can get by with just two people. And in some cases, you can get by with those not being full time people, but don't count on that. So we have these two roles, we must have two very good professionals. And don't try to think that either of these can be a cheap person. If you're thinking you can hire someone under $100,000 for either of these roles, or even potentially close to $100,000, even if you let them work from home, you're in for a nasty surprise, you are almost certainly going to be paying more than if you hired people who were worth more. Because these are not roles that you could possibly do without a lot of skill. And no matter how much you think you can eliminate all the decision making that they need to do to do this efficiently and well, you can't. That's a myth. Don't lie to yourself because you're the one who will get hurt. If you think a $50,000 developer is going to be able to fill those shoes of being the single developer and thinking of everything that might go wrong, that's how disasters happen, right? And later, when someone says, whose fault is this? You can guess who is it's going to be. Not the developer who was way in over their head and just needed a job and took one at 50K. It's going to be the people who hired them and threw things on them, knowing there was no realistic possibility that they could have the scope and skills and experience necessary to oversee something that large. And the same with the analyst. If anything, that's the more expensive role. Now, 
That doesn't mean that this is impossibly expensive. It simply means it's not silly cheap, right? You wouldn't expect any other role to be able to do those kinds of things to oversee everything that a business needs and have no experience doing so. So you can't expect it from your engineers. Not a problem. So we're looking at a realistic amount of num um, amount of money that's probably south of half a million dollars a year to start making your own enterprise bespoke software in house. And don't be misled by the thought that well, there's only two people. How much can they make? In reality, two good people who aren't stepping on each other's toes can make an awful lot of software if you know what it is you want them to do. Right? If you have a clear vision and they are good at their jobs, they're going to move pretty quickly, and you're actually going to be able to build something. Now, now, it depends on what you want to build. Uh, you may need a team of 100 developers, especially if you're an enterprise. You may need a 1,000 developers. That's realistic. But if you're a tiny business and you're looking at pure software just for your internal team, having just two people is completely realistic, right? Um, and many companies would be thrilled with what two people could turn out. And you don't necessarily need to keep two people indefinitely just through the engineering phases, which are probably going to be a few years. But... They're probably, and all these probabilities are based around mid sized companies making normal workflow software. If all you need is something really tiny, you might need people for two months. If something is really big, you may need a team of a lot of people for a long time. It's going to vary, but medium, small and medium sized businesses have a tendency to have similar workflows that only need so much work, at least to get them up and running. Now, once they're up and running, what tends to happen is they want to just keep adding on and adding on because they have this bespoke software and they find there's so many ways that they can benefit from it that they want to have uh, a continuous growth around that because they can actually use bespoke software to build their business. And in many ways, that software may become their business, which is super cool because it's one really competitive. Once you're doing that stuff, you basically start to, you know, just overrun all of your major competitors because people aren't doing that stuff for whatever reason. So that's a huge competitive advantage in many cases. And it just makes you super unique. Uh, it tends to lower your overhead quite a bit. It's a big investment up front, but long term, it can be super valuable, especially as you continue to customize more and more over time and build more of your workflow into a single system. You just eliminate the need for people and increase how much every person you have is able to do and your own visibility into the company and your ability to potentially uh, sell the company or get investors or just whatever. Bespoke software is a big component to a lot of things that you want to do as a business. So the things that I want to really get across here, one, bespoke software is super awesome if you're able to do it and that lots of companies that think this is out of their reach are wrong. It's well within their reach. Um, you know, whether you're spending $250,000 a year or half a million dollars a year to kind of, those are kind of your entry level numbers somewhere in that range, depending on how complex it is, how much you want people to work. You may get lucky and find people who are willing to work for a lot less that are willing to work from home. You find someone who's near shore, um, how flexible you are uh, with language barriers. There's a lot of things you can do to get the price down, but it's never going to get low, right? And, uh, but you may get lucky, right? And if you're a great employer, the more likely you are to get lucky. Bad employers have to pay a lot extra to maintain staff, but great employers who aren't just making the work uh, life bad for the sake of making it bad, are able to hire just across the board much more inexpensively because they're just giving a better value to their employees. I want you to really internalize that you have an option that any business of a reasonable size, even a small doctor's office or um, a small manufacturing facility, these kinds of businesses can easily afford, they may not be able to justify afford, and justify are different things, they, but they should be able to relatively easily afford making custom software for themselves. Now, justifying it is a completely different thing, and you need to sit down with your CFO and say, and your IT, and a potential development team, and say, what would it take? How far would we get? What will it cost? What are the benefits, right? And in some cases, it's simply not gonna be worth it. It may sound great. It may be really nice for you as a company, but it may cost you more than it's than it's fixing, right? So you don't wanna do it. But it, in many cases, you, you could look and say, well, I've got an ERP system, it's costing me 300,000 to acquire and 500,000 to customize, I've got $800,000 to work with. How quickly could I make something that isn't just good enough for $800,000, but better and completely unique to our business for less or for similar? 
Now there's more to consider, and this is something I've seen businesses look at, and one is forming a consortium. If you're, let's say, a manufacturing company and you work in a very specific way, there's a good chance that you may know other manufacturing companies that work in the same way that you do. Or let's say you're a doctor's office, and you probably have contacts with other doctor's offices that work in a very similar way to what you do. Not always, but really often. If you get those together, you may, you know, let's just say you're a doctor, you could easily go out and find 10 or 20 or a thousand other clinics and say, look, we all have a shared interest. We all have a goal and we're not being met by our industry, assuming they're not being met by the, their industry. What if we built our own software as a group that meets everybody's needs, everybody pitches in, and none of us have to pay for it outside of the cost of the development? Really quickly, you may have a you know, let's say it's a reasonable number. Let's say you have 10 and let's say the software costs a million dollars. Each clinic only has to pay a hundred thousand dollars, which may be far less than they're paying for something else anyway. And when it's said and done, they have something that they own that they could bring in another clinic and offset the cost some more. They could do something custom with it that no one else is doing. They could simply lower their cost long-term, whatever they have options because they're in control. Consortiums are a powerful, powerful way to deal with software if you're already in an industry and have contacts. Another is as a company that may invest in something like this, and this happens a lot, uh, and I've been involved in companies that have done this, uh, where you have a company that may have a unique need and has the cash flow and the wherewithal to invest in custom software solutions. They may do so and then turn around and become either a software vendor or a software as a service vendor and provide the products that they just created to other companies in their industry or to other companies near their industry. Uh, and in which case they may monetize and may actually make the bespoke software turn into a profit center on its own ignoring how it may affect the business itself in the long run. And I've seen that happen as well, right? That can be a very successful model, but of course that's a lot more risky. You're actually investing in becoming a software company rather than simply trying to lower your own cost. So it's a little bit different than traditional bespoke, but it all fits into the picture of strategizing how to make your bespoke software make sense for your business. But the takeaway here I want to be, bespoke software is one, very cool. Two, it is never cheap. The skills needed to do anything well in a business is going to be quite costly, but it is not so costly as to be out of the reach of a normal, successful, even relatively small business. And so if you have a business that is profitable, has any amount of contacts, has any amount of future, and any amount of uh, uniqueness. There is a good opportunity that bespoke software may be a good answer for you and you should look into it. At least ask the question and see how good is what's off the shelf for you, how expensive might it be to start creating something, and what value might that bring to your company. Ask those questions because that's how we start moving our businesses forward, right? Think critically, ask good questions. Thanks for joining me. Remember to like, subscribe. I am really hoping that we are getting back on track this year. It has been a crazy year here at Sam IT. Uh, you can support us on Patreon. It is all very much appreciated. Uh, this educational uh, program is something that's very meaningful to me. I've had a very long year. I don't want to say a rough year. It's just been a very, very busy year, and I have not had a chance to work on the channel very much, but I'm working very hard on getting back to it. Uh, I am super busy over the next few days. I'm speaking at MangoCon here in Dallas, Texas, uh, but we'll be getting stuff out on the channel soon. I do have uh, my camera rig set up, and so you can see it's a lot better than it's been. I have the lighting working pretty well. Um, it's nothing, you know, super professional, but it, it, I think it looks pretty good and I'm happy with how it's turning out. And the audio is way better than it used to be. So all moves in the right direction. And I have tons of material that I want to get out in video and a lot of people who, are, who have been asking for stuff. So... Welcome back to the channel. I'm looking forward, we have over 900 subscribers at this point. We're about to break the thousand mark. Uh, super excited about that for sure. And I am gonna be taking a break in a month, so I'm hoping to get a lot of material done in the next month because I am headed to Europe for a month, um, not to live and not exactly a vacation, but I will be there uh, not making Sam IT videos during June, uh, but it will be a nice break for me. Uh, looking forward to that. Thanks for joining me, everybody, and I look forward to uh, talking to you again soon.